Hi, I'm Hua Guan Lin, lecturer in Chinese Studies, University of New South Wales, Sydney. I'm John Font Kovalis, professor of Chinese Studies at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. John, congratulations on your book being published uh, at San Yan Shu Ju in uh, Beijing, China. This is uh, one of the best uh, commercial presses in China today. And congratulations on your book, Wei Miao de Ge Ming. Um, this book has been, has been published now, in, in this time in 2020. Uh, what do you think this book, published by a Westerner, about a challenging body of poetry and criticism in the classical Chinese language, will speak to the Chinese audience today? And what do you think it will accomplish there? Well, to begin with, I think there is an audience for the book in China. Um, I've been assured of that by Huang Xiaosheng, who is the director of the Lushun Museum. We have a picture of Lushun here today. Um, and, and also, uh, I believe that it comes at an important time in terms of Australia-Chinese relations, because uh, relations have been deteriorating, unfortunately. And in many ways, I've dedicated my entire adult life to try to further understanding uh, of China in the West. And I think in, in a way, this book might contribute uh, in a very small way to that, I hope. The attraction the book has for the Chinese market, I uh, suspect right now, has to do with the, um, the whole question of nativism, mm. right? The idea that somehow the book makes the argument that uh, the Chinese got there first in terms of uh, modernity uh, in poetry. Uh, and of course, the, the book is basically uh, an examination of the whole question of the entry of modernity into Chinese belles lettres. Uh, and I, what I've concluded is that modernity entered Chinese literature first through the vehicle of classical style poetry, mm -hmm. um, not through fiction not through imitation of, of Western fiction or Western drama, but rather through uh, poetry, which was the, the, the most elevated and, and most prized of the literary genres among the elite. This is remarkable and must say truly, truly revolutionary. No wonder my uh, advisor at Princeton, Perry Link, called you the most, the foremost scholar of uh, Chinese literature in the West. And John, you were my first teacher on Chinese literature back here in Australia in my undergraduate days. Uh, and you've, I finished a thesis on Gao Xinjian, uh, which was inspired by you. And later on, I went on to do my master's at Oxford and then Princeton and a PhD at uh, Cornell on Chinese diasporic literature. So we have a long history uh, of intellectual um, uh, discussion uh, for a long, 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 long time. Um, can you tell us uh, how you got interested in studying China? Thank you. Uh, I don't know that I'm the foremost authority on Chinese literature in Australia, but it's kind of parry to say that about me. Um, I grew up in a rather out-of-the-way small town in, in western Pennsylvania, and uh, China was not part of the high school curriculum. I chanced to get a hold of two or three books by Lu Xun in English translation. The translations were done by Yang Xianyi and his wife, Gladys Taylor Yang, published in, in Beijing in the 1960s at Foreign Languages Press, where I eventually ended up working some years later, doing editing and also translating. I picked up, I think, a book in, in the public library in, in Swickley in my hometown, uh, called The Other Side of the River, which mm -hmm. is a book by Edgar Snow about his, uh, his travels in China in the early 1960s. And I had read his previous book, his earlier book, uh, Red Star Over China, Xi Xing Man Ji, which he published in the, the 1930s about the, the Long March and, and so on, the, the early leaders of the Communist Revolution in China. Uh, I was impressed by Lu Xun because he represented to me a tradition of opposition in China, which I never knew existed there. Growing up in America, I thought of 
China as something like a nation of ducks all walking in line behind each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and reading Lu Xun and realizing that these things he had written were published in the 1920s and 30s and also that they'd been translated into English and then later uh, published in Beijing in, 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 in English in, in the 1960s uh, gave me a, a whole different angle on China. And I also grew up during the, the war in Vietnam. Uh, and I remember when I, I went into high school, I remember um, in a geography class, one of the teachers was talking about the war in Vietnam. And he said, uh, uh, war in Vietnam is basically a war against China. And I remember putting up my hand and saying, if that's the case, why are the Chinese having the Cultural Revolution now. It's like a civil war of their own making. Mm -hmm. I would think they would concentrate on fighting the United States in Vietnam and not do this whole, this whole civil war. Uh, and I was surprised because the teacher said he hadn't heard about the Cultural Revolution and he didn't know what was going on internally in China. Huh. So that gave me the idea that perhaps this is something worth studying about. And of course, the Chinese language is like the Latin of the Orient. So if I wanted to help American people better understand China and better understand what was going on in East Asia, so as to avoid being manipulated by politicians on the basis of their ignorance of East Asia, that this was something that was really worth studying. How did Lu Xun contribute to this? How did Lu Xun galvanize your interest? Well, Lu Xun is a a very, very interesting author in that he is oppositional. Uh, he is a critic of, I would say not a critic of Chinese tradition and not a critic of Confucianism, but rather he is a critic of the misuse mm. of Chinese tradition by, say, warlords or reactionary forces to try to justify their authoritarian rule. And I, I think this is one of the things that interested me uh, in Lu Xun is his, um, his relationship to the tradition as well as his relationship to what's going on mm. in, in mm. China of his day. Mm. Lu Xun, as we know, is, not, is no, known as the founder of modern Chinese uh, literature. Uh, and that title comes from his accomplishment from, from uh, the Bai Hua, right, from vernacular Chinese. Mm -hmm. So, John, what made you ch uh, do a, uh, choose a different path? What made you choose to study Lu Xun's classical style poetry and his later as early essays, which he also wrote in classical Chinese? With the poetry, I was interested in this delicate interplay between um, tradition and modernity. I was also interested in trying to get to know better the private Lu Xun, the subjective poet mm. who speaks to us in this time-honored genre of classical poetry uh, in a way which is a little bit different, a little bit more subjective, a little bit more emotional than the worldly internationalist uh, who we read uh, in his, his later essays. Mm. Now you ask about the classical uh, essays by Lu Xun, which I also studied. I was interested in, in knowing what the influences on Lu Xun had been, mm. uh, particularly when he was young. And so I studied his classical style essays written in Japan during his last few years there. That was 1907 to 1908. And I discovered that he was influenced by a whole, a whole slew of, of, of different writers. I mean, you talk about classical literature, he's influenced by Qi Yuan. He's influenced by Zhuangzi, but he's also influenced by Ibsen, mm. for instance. Uh, he's influenced by Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, uh, Korolenko, Mickiewicz, uh, Pushkin, Patufi, the Hungarian poet. Uh, and this is all in his, his lengthy treatise, Molo Shirley Shuo, on the power of Mara poetry, which is actually a book-length study, not only of 
Western literature, but also of, of classical Chinese literature. So um, some scholars in China, particularly Zhao Rei Hong, the late Zhao Rei Hong, professor of uh, Chinese and comparative literature at Nanjing University, said this is really the first example of comparative literature study in China, is, is Lu Xun's essay, Mo Long Shi Li Shuo. And it is quite lengthy, it's a nine-part essay, and probably William Lyle, the late uh, scholar of Lucian said uh, it's actually a book length study. Wow, this is this is very very fascinating. Uh, moving on to uh, Wei Miao the Geming, what made the works of the poets of the old school in the late Qing and the early Republic uh, on whom you focus so special? After all, they were considered by Hu Shi, for instance, merely to be producers of fake antiques, and most of them were dismissed by later critics as monarchist and reactionaries. Yeah, I remember Hu Shi's characterization, Jia <laughs> uh, fake antiquities. Yeah, um, I wanted to try to get away from the political reading uh, mm -hmm. of late Qing poetry to begin with. That's the first thing. Second thing was I was looking for the antecedents to Lu Xun's classical verse. What were the poets in, in the generations right before him mm -hmm. writing about? And thirdly, of course, I got interested in the whole question of the entry of modernity uh, into Chinese belles lettres. Mm. When did it take place? How did it take place? In what genre did it, did, did it come in first? And I started reading Western literary criticism because I didn't want to fall into the trap of saying Chinese literary modernity is something that came about by imitating the West or by being influenced by the West. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to search for native roots. So I started looking at how modernity is defined by Western literary critics when they look at, at modern Western poetry. And so I started reading I.A. Richards, uh, F.R. Levis, Cox, Hinchcliffe, the, those people, and I I concentrated on what they were saying about Ezra Pound and mm. I think uh, even more than Pound on what they were saying about T.S. Eliot. The idea, for instance, that Levis has about how Eliot in the first part of The Wasteland, which was written in 1922, uh, first part is called The Burial of the Dead, how Eliot focuses on writing through the use of illusion, mm. and how he addresses an elite audience. And I began to think, this is exactly what you see in much of the poetry written in the late Qing era. Huh. And for that reason, some modern critics say, oh, well, it was a moribund uh, genre uh, for a sort of a, uh, a few elite people. Uh, actually, I think much more was happening there. We see the same things happening in late Qing poetry that we see happening in, in the wasteland. Mm. But what happened in China is that all this was written earlier. If you look at the first major poet that I look at uh, in the book, Wang Kaiyun, he's somebody who was a, an advisor to Zhang Guofan, mm -hmm. and that was the, the um, Han uh, Confucian official who raised the army and fought the Taiping Rebellion. Right. Uh, and we're talking, some of his earliest poems are 1860, 1861, uh, about the, the destruction uh, wrought by the, um, the Taiping uh, Rebellion and what needed to be done to try to reform China. Mm. Probably the, the most remarkable work by Wang Kaiyun is this Yuan Ming Yuan Si. Uh, it's, if we translate that, we could translate it as the Ode to the... Um, old Summer Palace, mm. Yuan Ming Yuan. And this is a, a long Gu Ti Shi, old style uh, classical poem, which is written um, in 1871. Now, 1871 was just 11 years after the, the, the burning and the sack of, of the Old Summer Palace by the Anglo French expedition uh, commanded by Baron Guo and mm. uh, Lord Elgin. Now, the reasons for the, the burning in the sack of the, the old summer palace were complicated. They were, it was done essentially in revenge for the deaths of, under torture of 19 French and, and British diplomats who had been sent to China to negotiate 
uh, the treaty that ended the Second Opium War, also known as the Arrow War. So it, it was an expeditionary force which was bent on revenge. And an interesting mm -hmm. part of the story is that uh, they had as an advisor working for them the son of Gong Zizhen. And Gong Zizhen was also a, a famous, I would say, mid Qing poet. Uh, Gong Zizhen, it said, was, was murdered or he was poisoned uh, because he was having a love affair with a, uh, a Manchu princess or a very high uh, uh, noble lady uh, wow. in the court. So the, the son was out to uh, get revenge for his father. Mm. Now, he said something interesting to uh, Baron Guo and to Lord Elgin. That he said, don't go and destroy Beijing which is what they were intending on doing. He said that people in Beijing, the common people, had nothing to do with what happened to your diplomats. If you want to get back at the Qing dynasty, go out and, and destroy or burn down the uh, Yuan Ming Yuan, okay? Because that's something that they really prize. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. This is this complex of palaces and so on. And so uh, apparently they listened to him and, and that's what they did. Now, Wang Kaiyun has a, an interesting take on it. Wang Kaiyun said, and he went there in 1871, walked around the ruins and he interviewed people in Haidian, in that, that area uh, just around the, the um, summer palace, asking what happened. Mm. And the conclusion he came to from what ordinary people said in the area was that the fire that burned down Yuan Ming Yuan was actually not started by the foreign troops. Hmm. It was started by local hooligans who wanted to cover up the fact that they were going to run in and pilfer uh, in the wake of all this. Wow. And this, of course, has uh, earned Wang Kaiyun uh, a degree of opprobrium uh, from Chinese historians and, uh, and subsequent literary historians, right, saying, you're, you know, this is not... Uh, what shall I say? Uh, it's not from a, a patriotic point of view. You're, you're excusing the foreigners. Whether or not Wang Kaiyun was right, I don't know. But getting back to the poem itself, what he does is he tells the whole history of the Yuan Ming Yuan in terms of allusions. He talks oftentimes about Han era palaces. Mm. Uh, and, and in a way, of course, there's a degree of historical irony there, right? Because they, the Manchu dynasty, the Qing dynasty, were not Hanzu, uh, they were they were Manzu, they mm. were people mm. who came from mm. outside of the, uh, the, the Great Wall, outside of the pass. And so in, in a way, he uses the destruction of the, the Yuan Ming Yuan as a way of exploring what's happened to China. Mm. And he takes it up to the present day, and he, 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 su he suggests a degree of, well, a, a, a series of ways in which China can right itself, but it's essentially blood, sweat, and tears. Mm. Uh, there's no easy way out of the situation. So I think in that sense, he's got, uh, a modern consciousness and also of course it reflects the impact uh, of the industrializing West the expanding imperialist powers and what they were able to do to these old uh, agrarian empires mm. so that's certainly there the next major poem that that I look at in the book is uh, actually a series of two poems that's Cai Yun Qian Hou Qu so Cai Yun is a literary stand-in for Sai Jian Hua. Mm. Uh, and these were written by a man called Fan Zhangxiang, uh, just a little bit after 1900. Sai Jian Hua, well, there's a historical character, Sai Jian Hua, and then there's a figure in popular legend. Sai Jian Hua was a, um, a concubine uh, who came from a, a sing-song boat, uh, a, a woman of very humble origins who ended up marrying Hong Jun, who was a, a, a learned high official in the Qing dynasty, and was subsequently sent to Europe as a, what we would call today an ambassador at large. Mm. So he took her with him as his wife, because his first wife was too old and didn't want to go, his second wife was uh, in frail health, and, and uh -huh. so she ended up going with him. Uh, she says she was 14 at the time. Uh, 
another chronology by uh, a Chinese scholar says so she was actually 24. But <laughs> either way, she was, uh, she was young and she was with him. Uh, in Berlin, she supposedly learned German uh, mm. and was able to converse with servants and so on. Uh, so th that's the first uh, of these two poems. The second one um, takes up after the uh, suppression of the Boxer Uprising in 1900. Sai Jinhua is in Beijing. Her husband has died. She's been driven out of the household by his kids and, and, and wives and so on, and is sort of living in, in straitened circumstances. The Allied armies, Bagua Lianjun, the armies of the eight allies, uh, fight their way into Beijing, uh, defeat the boxers. The Empress Dowager and, and the, the young emperor flee to Xi'an. Mm. Because of her knowledge of German, uh, Sai Jianhua presents herself to Valderze, who is the, uh, the commanding uh, general of the, uh, the eight allied armies, and uh, they take up residence together in the Forbidden City. Uh, and in this period of time, they're ruling very much as the emperors and the empress might do. Hmm. Uh, according to the popular legend, Sai Jianhua intercedes again and again with Walter Zay to get Walter Zay to spare people's lives, to spare certain parts of the city like Liu Lichang, uh, so on and so forth. There's a fire in the Forbidden City. They, they narrowly escape with their lives. And then finally, of course, when the peace accords are signed in 1901, they have this sort of very sad departure. Now, where is the modernity? Um, first of all, the uh, Western impact, the industrialized uh, imperialist forces. But secondly, the irony in the poem that all of these traditional power structures are rent asunder. Uh, Sai Jianhua, who is a, uh, a concubine, uh, takes the place of Cixi Taiha. Mm. And it's, in a way, it's to her credit, Sai Jianhua comes off very well in the poems, unlike the lighter novel by Zheng Pu called Nia Hai Hua, mm. Flower in the Sea of Sin, which was written around 1907, mm. uh, subsequent essays and uh, editions in, in the 1930s. Uh, she comes off positively uh, as a protectress of the people, mm. as a protectress of the nation. She is even called at one point, uh, uh, she's called a uh, uh, Hugo Niang Niang. Huh. Hugo wow. Niang Niang is like a, a bodhisattva mm. who protects mm. the country. Mm. So, I mean, uh, you've got irony, you've got tragedy, uh, you've got the, the, the brunt of the imperialist forces, and you've also got the, the collapse of the traditional belief system. And I think that's one of the, the ways in which um, these poems are similar to The Wasteland by right. Eliot. Right. If you move on then to the, the uh, third group of poets I look at, they're usually called Tongguangti mm -hmm. poets. The, the poets of the, 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 well, these are two reign era names in, in the late Qing dynasty. We have Chen Yan, uh, who was a literary critic who later on became, he made a transition to modern academia because he became a professor at, at Beida, wow. Beijing University later. Uh, we also have Chen Sanli, uh, who was quite a prominent um, figure in 19, in the, in the, excuse me, 1898 reforms with his father, who was governor of Hunan, which was a model reform province in 1898. And of course, this earned him and his father opprobrium from the Empress Dowager, who was mm -hmm. very much against that group, and, and in fact overthrew them. So in a way, his poetry becomes a sort of a, a way to ruminate on the defeat of the 1898 reform movement, but also on the tragedy this, that this brought about, and mm -hmm. that includes the 1911 revolution and its aftermath. Mm. Uh, the killing, the chaos, the beginning of the warlord era. That's all in there. Mm. And then I also look at poetry by Zheng Xiaoxu, who was a, a high-level Qing dynasty, uh, Wen Guan, uh, a civil uh, official who was also a great military commander like Zheng Guofan. Mm. Uh, and his disillusion, again, with the, the republic, 
um, and also his his idea that something fundamentally had gone wrong, and the this sort of the idea of the the collapse of the traditional belief system is is there as well. So the, these are the groups of poets. These are the figures that I deal with. Fascinating, fascinating, John. Uh, do you want to tell us a little, a little more? This is all, all, all too good. Any exa specific examples you want to share with me from a particular poetry? Well, I've got that one poem that uh, that I could talk about. Uh, this is a poem that Chen San Li wrote uh, right after the 1911 revolution in mm. 1913. He had returned from Shanghai to his villa outside of Nanjing, uh, and he describes the, what what had happened in the wake of the revolution. Uh, I can read it in, in English, or, or I can read it in, in Chinese original. Um, the mountain of the bell, that's Zhongshan in Nanjing, looms before my face. Qin wo yan, mm. right? It's, it's almost like it's kissing my face. It's brooding melancholy, suggesting indignation. Xi nu ru bu ping. The green brook winds around my feet. Qing xi rao wo zu, babbling with sounds like sobbing. Yo zuo wu yan sheng. The year before last was one of wanton slaughter. Corpses strewn throughout the city beneath the mountain. Women and children trampled to death, their bodies glutting the creek, strewn across its banks. Who can still call this a place of natural beauty when such gloom has clouded these once fair skies? The half moo of garden to the side of my house is laid out orderly as squares of a chessboard. Someone points to where, neath the parapets at the corner of the city wall, the son of a neighbor was slain by the arrogant soldiery. Haggling over a handful of vegetables, one word of disagreement and a white blade glistened in the sun next to the thatched gate. By his side, a white-haired mother groveled. Together with his wife, children in her arms, weeping, pleading for his life. Shouting in their fury, the soldiers paid no heed, and the earth turned crimson as the blood gushed forth. Now, if one glances out toward the tower of the city wall by night, in the darkness of the moon, the will of the wisp glimmers bright. And of course, in a sense, the death of the young man at the hands of the soldiers becomes a microcosm for the whole situation in mm. China at that point, at the beginning of the, the World War era. And of course, as warfare became more modern, more and more civilians became the casualties. Uh, the last line of the poem is extremely ironic, right? We have the darkness in the moon, uh, of course, symbolizing the darkness which had come over society. Mm. And with this, the poet contrasts the eerie phosphorescent glow, that's uh, Lin Ying Ying, which is given off over graveyards uh, in compost heaps where you have organic material uh, which is decaying. Now, in the absence of the last true source of light, which is the moon. I suppose we can say that the moon at least reflects the light of the sun, mm. right? Death is there and death produces this erzatz glow, this guayho, these ghost flames, mm. right? Uh, perhaps ironically, the justification for the revolution, right? Light, guangming, etc. the bright promise of a new social order. All of China, in fact, has become a graveyard, a wasteland, a killing field. So you have the same sentiments uh, articulated in similar ways to what we see in, in Eliot, uh, The Wasteland, written in 1922. So uh, my point is not to say that the Chinese got there first. My point is simply to say that there are similar phenomena going on in poetry at this time, uh, and, and this is what I would call modernity uh, mm. in Chinese literature. Fascinating, John. Fascinating. Can you tell us where can we get a hold of this book if we're not in uh, mainland China today, we're not in Beijing? 
Well, I'll try to get uh, Kino Cunha in, in downtown <laughs> Sydney to, to order it. Uh, I might get one of the bookstores in Chinatown, China Books, to order it. Maybe we can even get uh, a copy or two at the uh, UNSW Bookshop. Congratulations, John. Uh, uh, as, as you always say, and the way you always congratulate other scholars on the launch of their books, uh, Luo Yang Zhi Gui, and may this book be uh, and be sold globally for all of us to purchase. Thank you.